right now. Uh, so, good afternoon again. Uh, we are moving from literary translation, cross-cultural uh, uh, translation, intercultural translation into more specialized area of translation in this new encounter are the shores of translation, which is legal translation, translating law. And we are going to discuss how to translate law, a legal uh, text or a legal discourse. We are very pleased to welcome our guest speaker uh, for today, who will be speaking on her book, Arabic, English, Arabic, Legal Translation. Dr. Hanim Al Farhati, welcome to this new encounter at the shores of translation. Dr. Hanim Al Farhati is a lecturer in Arabic, English Arabic translation and interpreting at the Center for Translation Studies and Arabic, Islamic, and Middle Eastern Studies at the University of Leeds, the acronym of which is AIMS UK. She is AIMS research leader and PGR Director. In 2011, El Farhati was awarded a PhD for her research into Arabic translation studies with a particular focus on legal translation. She has taught Arabic and translation at a number of UK universities and English linguistics and English Arabic translation at the University of uh, Mansoura, Egypt. El Farhati is the author of Arabic, English, Arabic legal translation, a book that I mentioned earlier, which is a groundbreaking investigation of the issues found in legal translation between Arabic and English. And she is the co-editor of the Ruth Rutledge Handbook um, and Book Chapters in Arabic, English legal translation comparative Arabic, English linguistics. Arabic language teaching and Arabic political satire. These are the chapters in this uh, uh, publication. We are really very pleased to welcome our distinguished guest. Mahanim uh, um, is um, a friend of mine, and I keep on repeating that the guest speakers, most of them are friends. So, so because sometimes you cannot um, uh, succeed sometimes in doing research or without a very good uh, network, of course, basically of friends and also of colleagues. And I think we met last time in a conference in Poland, in Poznań, uh, if you can remember, Henem. So, <laughs> thank you. So, uh, Henem has kindly accepted my our invitation, and she will be speaking about uh, translating legal discourse, translating terminology, legal terminology, and the culture-specific issues uh, in legal texts. So, and perhaps if we have some time, how to translate syntax, auxiliaries, and so on and so forth. Uh, without further ado, we have just one hour. Um, Dr. El Farhati will be speaking for 15 minutes, perhaps 20 minutes, and then we are going to open it uh, for discussion. You have the floor, uh, Dr. El Farhati, without further ado. Thank you so much. Really very, very uh, pleased to be invited to give a talk to you and to your students and to an, uh, a wider audience uh, as well. Uh, yes, you are a very dear friend to me, a very dear colleague. I follow your work very closely and yes, I'm very honored to be with, with you all. Uh, as you said, without further ado, I will, I will invest in the time left and I might need a bit more. <laughs> Uh, than 15 minutes, to be honest, uh, because I'll, I'll, I'll take the students through or the audience through what I will be uh, talking about, but I need to share my screen first, please. Can you see my screen? Hello? Yes. Can you see it? I right. was muted. Yes, we can see it. Can you put it full screen, please? Yes, of course I do, but I will miss part of it, which I need to oh. follow. So it's okay. Uh, we can see so, it. Uh, I'll try, and then if I can, if I can minimize the camera itself, so I'll see yeah. what I can do. 
okay. first, then we'll work around that. I don't think this will work with the camera. So I, I really, you, you would see Go ahead, me. go ahead. We, 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 <laughs> see, we, me, we see it see crystal clear you. both ways, yes. No, no, yes. no worries. Uh, but pardon me if, you, if I do any, any movements or anything because I can see my, myself now. <laughs> okay. So as, as the, the, uh, Professor Salih just uh, introduced, I'll be to taking you through my book. And of course, this book has, has to have to be taught really in many hours. <laughs> uh, so I'll be picking and choosing the most relevant uh, parts of it that are really easy to follow. Uh, some some in interactive uh, points and also some good examples to take home today, I hope. Uh, so uh, quickly about the books I published. And by the way, this English book have been uh, translated into Arabic by uh, my dear colleague, Ra Dr. Rafat al Wazna from King Abdulaziz University, Jeddah. So if you are interested to, re to read the Arabic version. And these are the two books in Arabic and in English. Uh, I'm, I'm going through quickly, as you can see, uh, to save time to the examples and uh, the points, the important points. Also, recent work I have been doing on legal only, uh, the things highlighted in red about modality of obligation and permission, and that's forthcoming in, uh, in, in Spain in 2020, hopefully, in Dove. And also, you have this uh, article on the Journal for Translation Studies, if you are interested, co-authored with a colleague of mine, about the translation of the term, term Karama and its collocates, a corpus-based study. And the rest, you know. And if you wanted more information, please go on my Twitter account, on my profile online, and you'll find these titles and links to them too, if you like. So what I'll, I'll, I'll aim to do is really not all of it, because I wanted to try to cover as much as I can, but the time doesn't allow, so I'll focus on the terminology first. Uh, but I'll take you through some uh, some. Uh, uh, about about an introduction, a quick, a quick introduction of, of uh, the book itself and also about, about the legal discourse, what you expect to, to have uh, first before we go on. So the focus of the book is, is the history of Arabic English legal discourse. And when we say discourse, I'm sure I will be using lots of terminology today. Um, some of them are technical or too technical, but I'll try to simplify them. But when we say Arabic legal discourse, we, we talk about uh, discourses spoken and written really, not necessarily only legal texts that we tend to translate as legal translators. Uh, I discussed only in the book the features of English and Arabic legal discourse. And up, up coming from these features, I come up with some similarities and some differences between legal discourse in English and legal discourse in Arabic. And, and based on this, I have figured out some of the common uh, specialized terminological, culture-specific, system-based difficulties that uh, us as professional translators, academics, and the trainee translators come across. So based on that, I have done my own analysis for, on some of the most problematic difficult areas that I have, be, I have, I have been investigating over the, these years and for which I will be talking to you about today, but some of them, not all of them really, uh, given the time constraints. But I invite you, if you wanted to read more on the history, go to chapter two. If you wanted to read more on the features and the comparative contrastive analysis I did, please go ahead and read chapter three. Chapter four, four and five and six are more relevant, but I'm going to try to summarize some of them today. I hope this helps. So, um, an int a quick introduction about legal discourse. Um, because I don't have time to explain to you the features, this slide is meant to give you a very quick <laughs> definition that really summarizes everything we need to know about the features of legal discourse, be it English, Arabic, French, any, really, any type or genre of legal discourse. So, it's about distinctive words or terminology, let me put it this way. It's about distinctive phrases as well, phraseology, we call it, modes of expression, so spoken or written, and it's about certain mannerisms of composition as well, so how we write this, the style of it. And when I speak about complexity, for example, later on, I mean to say this is the manner of writing a contract or a partnership contract, etc. So this little definition gives us a lot. 
it's not exclusive with the profession, but prevalent to have formed a fixed association. So it's specific in, it, in its own right. It, that's why we call it a specialized, really specialized translation or technical translation. So, uh, lots of people have lots of categorization for legal discourse. And I chose to speak to you about this one because it's, to me, it tends to be holistic. Although I have included lots of more categorization in, in my chapter two in the book. So as you can see in the red, to save your time, we will be focusing today on our discussion, more or less to major extent on legal texts, legal documents, legislations, United Nations documents, Sharia law documents, birth certificates, official documents, of course, because this could be also another way of categorizing legal discourse is official documents could be a separate genre or a separate type of it. But also we need to be aware that legal discourse is not necessarily only about legal documents or texts. It's also about lawyers talking about, about the law to each other as lawyers or to people, clients, to lay persons. And of course, it will differ how they talk about it. And also we talk about the language of the courtroom, which is a very big genre of legal discourse, courtroom, uh, courtroom trials, witness exchanges, counsel exchanges, judges uh, declaring the law, etc. There is also books that are, are written on legal discourse that we, call, we, we are classifying as categories of legal discourse, and so on and so forth. But as I said, we will only focus on legal texts today. So I want to hear from you as, as, as by means of brainstorming how much you know about the difficulties of legal translation in general and between English and Arabic in particular. So if I can open the floor for one minute to hear from you before I go on. But by I can see you again. Hands. <laughs> yes. So. Well, I think like one of the main, um, can you hear me? Yes, yes I we can. can. Well, one of the main difficulties I faced when translating legal documents before is that the text uh, is too long right. and the structure is too complex and like rendering this into Arabic, like it takes a lot of time to to understand the, the structure of the sentence for you Yeah. Okay. Uh, before you convey it to, into Arabic. Yes, I'm glad you joined, you jumped quickly to the second half of my presentation, which I hope we'll cover later. But it's really a major issue. Thank you so much. Talking about the lengthy document itself, this is one issue. But within this lengthy document, we also come across difficulties of lengthy sentences, complex sentences. Uh, yes, uh, too much information load in one go is given, and this really adds to the difficulty of translating it. Thank you, Rana, so much. Can we hear from somebody okay. else? Okay, Abir and then Wael, please. Uh, I think uh, when I was uh, translating a legal uh, text, uh, the main uh, things that I faced is uh, difficulties was uh, to translate the, we don't have the same meaning in Arabic and uh, the synonyms of that word in Arabic or English. Mm. Yes. Uh, it's, uh, maybe, Makes sense. Uh, so it's about the terminology, the one-to-one -one correspondence, uh, yes. the difficulty of getting the fun functional meaning of one term, isn't it? Thank you so much. True. Well, please. Well, unlike, unlike uh, translating uh, literary texts where you mm -hmm. have uh, uh, space to move, uh, translating legal uh, texts, it's limited. You don't have any space. Mm -hmm. You mm -hmm. just know or don't know the term. It's binary opposition. There is <laughs> a term and it's uh, other term in the, other, in the target language. But yes. personally speaking, I still can move <laughs> with translation terms. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think, yeah, well, I don't know region. what you mean by moving in literary translation. We'll have a... So a margin of freedom, perhaps. We we'll have to have a very big... Uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> so I'll have to... Just 
Yes, of course. But thank you so much, Wael, and everybody. I have to stop uh, brainstorming because, yes, you touched upon some of the difficulties I anticipate to hear from everybody who is new to this field and also everybody who is a professional translator. We know how to find terminology, how to translate them, but we still need to develop, we still need to have our own resources to keep finding them and find valid ones, etc., etc. So it's not a, an easy job, and I'm sure Professor Salhi agrees with me here. So let me move on. So these are in, in, in a nutshell, and as you can see, I'll be referring you to some references, which I'm happy to share with you at the, at the end, but they are also included in my book. So these are the people who talked about the theory of legal translation and why they think it's difficult. So as you just mentioned, it's about the nature of the legal language, technical, a specialized nature of it. As you said, Rana, at the beginning, very lengthy, very complicated. So it's not only about technical terminology, but it's about its being specialized, too technical. The nature of the technical language we mentioned, and also it's not a universal language. It's tied up to a national legal system, and I assume this was one of the points raised. It's, it's, we need to find the same terminology that does the same function in another legal system. So it's not about really transferring one word to another in a one language to another. It's about translating between le one legal system to another. And this is what Waste Flog tends to tell us, and it's true to every language, including English and Arabic. So why it is difficult? Because of the asymmetry of legal systems, again, according to Pomer, and congruency of legal terminology and legal cultural diversity. So this adds another layer of difficulty. Not only legal system difficulty, but cultural diversity, talking about Arabic and English legal systems and cultural systems as well, this adds to the difficulty. And I'll give you... Yeah. Yeah. And examples of this would be barrister, solicitor, court, and case law. And I'm defining these examples as authentic because this, this is the corpus I used to find these examples. So you could add millions of other terms to these. So it's not confined to these very simplistic examples. But I try to be authentic and honest because this is the data I used. And there are also what we call semi-technical terminology, like, as you can see, assessment, enclosed, compensation, etc. And I'm sure you will add to this a lot more. Semi, the ma'na or meaning that we use it in legal context and also in a normal life context. And we call them legal homonyms because they really do two, two functions, two jobs. Also, we have everyday language that we use in legal uh, texts and legal discourse, like reports, record, etc., examine, injury, normal everyday language that we can find in legal uh, texts too. So I want you to think about it is not only confined to specialized terminology, but also you could find lots and lots of any other everyday language terminology that you could uh, find in translating legal texts. So now, my strategy for this quick introduction or quick uh, session is to try to um, get you familiar with the things we could find that are difficult or need a bit of research and a bit of effort from our behalf based on the research I did on teachers of both. So I'm really collecting a lot of data as I go along from the book, giving it in one <laughs> intensive portion today if, if I can. And I'm going to suggest to you some solutions for these difficulties we find. And I, when I say suggest, this means it's not set in the stone. It's my, my research based on the literature and based on my experience, but it's also open to discussion. You might have a different viewpoint as professionals too. So, so some of the terminology you can find archaic and Latin terms. And we, you know what archaic means. Archaic means antiquated, all the terminology that, is, that dates back really to the Anglo-Saxons, old English. 
dating back to the fifth century or even before in, in, in the Middle Ages, etc. So it's about the terminology that dates back to a long time and it still continues to exist in legal English. And it's like the bread, <laughs> bread and butter of some of the lawyers that tended to use it. Some of them sometimes are not determinate and some of them could, could, we could do without them. And some of them are there because, as I said, uh, lawyers <laughs> like to draft in this way and to use them. So what if we come across things like hereby, here under de facto, pro rata, inter alia, and sorry if I read it quickly, I'm trying to save the time. Uh, I just wanted to get the idea of what I mean by archaic and Latin terminology. Uh, so in, in reality, we don't have a one-to-one -one correspondence in our English discourse in, in this area, but we have solutions in Arabic. So we have to, there is also, as been mentioned, one more viable solution. And I, I, I'm, I'm sure you are thinking now about how to translate this into Arabic. Uh, can I, out, out of curiosity, can I hear from you only one? How will you translate any of this? Not necessarily in Arabic. Don't give me the term in Arabic, but how you will do it. Yes. Yes. Um. Hereby, like uh, Bimu <laughs> uh, Yes, thank you. I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm talking about the whole process. When you come across a list of these, you need to, uh, as, as Jacobson mentioned in his very well-known publication, 1959, said, translate it interlingually. By this, translate it first into English, because it might not be an English term like Latin, de facto or inter alia. So we need to know what it is first in English, and then by contrastive analysis or by finding the corresponding term in Arabic that it can vary depending on the context really, to be, to be honest. Uh, and uh, Garazzoni, uh, and very well Italian, uh, very well known Italian, um, scholar mentioned always find the parallel routines by this we may find how these are translated into arabic and find authentic texts that have been translated that use similar terminology like this and routines means what what have been published for example in the united nations that uses terminology like this Corbra, parallel Corbra could also help. So I'm giving you tips on how to find the information as they go along as well. And one example would be, do you hereby declare, I'm going down up, I jump quickly. I hereby declare, I didn't translate it. I just say, and, 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 and this is not me, these are, by the way, this is not me translating it. These are authentic examples I found in the data. Or learn without Mujibi, Kama Kulti, Zamila, Tina, or Sadiqatin. We also have hearing in this, in this document. It means first in this document, and then we translate it as Al Wari Dafi, mentioned in it as a back translation, etc. So, what we really need to know is we have in Arabic a non archaic terminology. We have a, a list of template terminology or phrases that we could refer to when we translate such a terminology. And all omission can be an option. And I'm sure you will ask why, because as you can see in this context, we don't really need to say, I declare. <laughs> Uh, yani another example is, uh, is a very good one I always want to, to, to show you how we do things like uh, Latin terminology, de facto. So we explain it as, as, as per the Black Law Dictionary, uh, the fourth edition, which says, Sharika Fa'liya, Ben Kusin Kida explanation, wa in link, wa in kanat lab testawfi, al ijraat al kanuli. Translating it, etc. So we need to to, uh, to explain it. We need to know what the facto company is in English, and then we could find the terminology equivalent to it by means of explaining, as you can see. And again, by means of interaction, have you heard of this terminology before? Habas corbus. I'm not sharing no. your your information. 
So yes, we, we all didn't know about it, but how do how will you do it then? This one is it the same way we just mentioned? Do you think? I don't think so. Uh, you don't think so? Okay. I assume we would more or less do the same, but we really need to know what it is first in English, and we come up with some some. Uh, because if you see, I'll see you. In a, I'll show you in a minute. It's a long one that we need to explain thoroughly and really get back to the origin of it. So a bit of research is demanded here, is required here, and then we'll get to give this, for example, as a translation. I, you, if you read through, it's a, a long explanation giving us. It's in Latin means you have the body, so we can translate let you have the body into Arabic without what, what does these people mean by you have the body. So we, we need to translate it based on what we have comprehended from this explanation, which means Al-Amr uh, Bil-Muthuli Amam al mahkama I hope you got the idea here. We work, uh, how, how we come Uh, across the texts, I'm going to show you two examples now in a minute. So, culture specific, religious, and culture specific terminology, examples of it would be a reference to God, Prophet Muhammad, Quranic verse, concluding remarks, religious concluding remarks that we could find in administrative official documents, in, uh, in speeches uh, uh, translated or recorded at the United Nations, in other uh, marriage certificates. Things like this that we will come across and we need to think about. Uh, so I'm sure you will have a lot to say here. So I'm going to jump quickly uh, or move on quickly. Uh, so translation of Basmala into either Allah or Allah slash God or God only, etc. It's up to you, depending on the readership on who you are tra translating it to. Really, because most of the time we tend to use God, but in some other contexts, possibly reference to Allah would be more important in this document. So we really need to be aware that each translation has got a function, has got a readership, and we need to have this in the back of our mind before we do it. I agree that it could be God, as I said, but in other, other people would say, no, it could be Allah or both. So this decision is up to you based on your readership. How about Alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala man la nabiyya ba'du, etc. Things like this, depending. Uh, concluding remarks, like, Wallahu wali tawfiq, Wallahu ta'ala khayru shahidi. So as I mentioned here, the suggestions is to refer to domestication by using uh, God or foreignization by using Allah. Uh, or omissions, Yani, uh, Axilla, I don't know if you have come across this book. Axilla justified the omission of culture specific terminology or phrases like this in cases where they are either unacceptable in the target culture, and I don't agree with him uh, using this term unacceptable, uh, or not used. I would rather <laughs> I would rather say not followed or not used in the target culture or not relevant, really, he, as he mentioned, irrelevant to the target reader. And this depends on the function of the text, as we said. So sh I'll show you these two examples to uh, make sense of what Professor Salhi, somebody in the waiting room is, is wanted to... Already accepted. Admitted. Thank you very much for the reminder. Uh, yeah, because it, it just shows on my screen. I hope you can see this screen uh, clearly. It's, uh, sorry if it's uh, just an image. But I want you to see the first few lines and the last few lines. You don't have to read the rest of it. Uh, so, as you can see, Hiyam in Allahi Mubaraka Tayyiba, or don't for his villa, he were a yeti, Phil Bedi, Uncle Sayyid Kum Shukri, or Tagdir Sayyid Wazir Shun Ela Ahire, or Phil Ahir, Jazakum Allah and Haira Jaza, or don't to the Hora Mubilahi Tofik. Okay? So, in this text, this is the corresponding target text, and this is authentic, by the way. I want you to look and see what happened. I'll give you like seconds. What do you think? As you can see, everything disappeared. The religious uh, 
Yes, it won't be a letter if you can see back in Arabic. It's about asking for some jobs, some people to fill some jobs. استشهاد لهذه العلاقة الطيبة أرجو تفضلكم بالتصدق والسماح لتدريب الكوادر البشرية تدريب ريب الإدارة العامة شغلتان I I I also have some 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 comments on the drafting of it or how it is written but this is not the time for for drafting but it's about asking for something it's not about really greetings and introductions and religious items that are not relevant to this sort of, of letter they are writing, in which case the omission of these elements is justified, really. And I agree with that. But I wanted you to look at this. And when I said but, I'm giving you a hint. Can you read it? Or look at it? Again, I'll read quickly. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Ayuha al-Ukhwa wa al-Azdaqa. الكرام السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته يسرني أن أشكركم على تلبية الدعوة لهذا اللقاء التاريخي وأن أرحب بكم باسم أخي خادم الحرمين الشريفين هافوي ثرو إن يا أيها الناس إن خلقناكم من ذكر وأنثى وجعلناكم شعوبا وقبائل لتعارفوا إن أكرمكم إن الله أتقاكم at the end at the end إلا أنني واثق بالله تماما من النتيجة النهائية وهي انتصار قوي حبة والتسامح والسلام إلى آخره والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله. If you read the English, which we don't have time to line by line, everything is rendered accurately. The Quran verse yes. there. Yes. Greetings. Do you know why? They wanted to keep the original flavor. I think like this, like keeping the Islamic greetings here, mm -hmm. um, like is required because. Like his, like the audience are most probably Muslims, and this is part of the discourse. Like uses these mm -hmm. kind of structures and these kind of greetings yes. are are yes. like one of the features of the Islamic discourse. Like omitting omitting them would be awkward here. Yeah, thank you so much. It's one of the features that you mentioned. The previous one was one of the features, I mean the previous uh, document, but the function of, of, of both is different and the context is different. This is a speech at the UN by some of the representatives of the Saudi government representing Khadim al Haramain Sharifain, the custodian of the two holy mosques. So it's everything he utters in one of these meetings is, is, is important. And I remember our discussion with our colleague yesterday, Professor Salhi, about the identity of these people, identity of Arafat, that not to be missed. The same here, it's an identity of the text. It represents his culture, as you said, it represents his, his religious background. He needs to prove a point by reciting or reciting some religious elements. So all this needs to be represented as adequate, as accurate as it is. And the, the case with, we will have another discussion on interpreting and how we interpret religious items at the UN. Uh, it's not the state for that here, uh, I'm afraid. So I hope you get the point. So it's nothing is set on the stone. We need to adapt. We need to be aware of why and when and where to who we are translating more or less. Dr. Farhad, there is a request, I think, from Rawan. And please, yes. if you have, uh, if you would like to react, uh, there is a, an icon, blue hand. Please, can you show that icon so that we know that you are requesting the floor to have some order in the in the discussion? Yeah. Yes, yeah, please. Thank you so uh, much. Thank you, but I don't have access to the camera, as I said. No, no, no I, I, I will, I will facilitate that. Don't worry. Please, I'm sorry. I'll get it back to you then. Yes, Ayman uh, so Tarhuni, please. Um, hello. Uh, so I I have just one little comment about the the translation of the of the Arabic text. Don't you think that um, the the translator here wanted to convey a certain ideology, a certain image of the of the person who wrote or spoke the first uh, text in Arabic? Mm -hmm. That he comes from a Muslim background and he wanted to convey that, especially that the very person who is talking here is the king of Saudi Arabia, and you, you know what comes with that. Of course, yes, I, I totally agree, and this is what I just mentioned. Yes, it's part and parcel of where he comes from, and it's very okay. important to keep it, of course, yes. And I'll give you another example that I mentioned in my, in my uh, book about the translation of the Universal Islamic Declaration of, of Human Rights, which I have retranslated with a colleague of mine at Leeds, 
this translation that was published uh, uh, on one of the very famous journals of human rights in the UK that drops all uh, religious references, cuts everything, and uh, making this universal Islamic declaration seems to be one one secular document presented to some English or European people to read. And, and, and I totally agree with your point about the identity of the text, so I didn't agree with this translation and I critiqued it thoroughly in the book. And the reason why I retranslated it is to represent the ideology there or the point of view represented in every single line of this document. So I totally agree. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So, uh, other examples really about from Sharia now, we talked about a little bit about you, the English legal system and a little bit about the UN system now from Sharia, from Arabic into English, because I promised to talk about both English and, and the Arabic really. So we come across lots of Sharia law and Islamic banking terminology that doesn't have equivalence as one of our friends mentioned at the beginning. So can you give me examples of this? And Professor Salhi, can we have one only to talk about it? Yes, please. Who would like to take the floor, please? I think no one. Okay. Yes, then Rana, please. Rana. Okay. And then Neda. Only one if uh, for time. Okay, Rana. Enough. Rana. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You are, you, you are muted, Rana. Sorry. Uh, the term Qard Hassan. Yes, bravo. Mm -hmm. Qard Hassan. Do you want more? Mm -hmm. That's fine uh, <laughs> for now, if you don't have any more. This I have more. Uh, mm -hmm. Reba, um, yes. Wikela, Takaful, yes, Musharka, well Mudarba. Mm -hmm. Well done. Okay, that's really good. So, how can this be translated? Do you know we can take the second person uh, in the queue to give everybody a chance, please? Okay. Hola, hola. Please. Yes, um, also like al idda mm -hmm. These are Sharia law, uh, yes. Yes. Uh, I think how to translate it, yes. Sure. Yes. How do you translate these? Uh, do you, do you know? Know? Yes, by translation or adding a kind of explanation uh, in two brackets. Mm -hmm. well, have to embark on it very, very uh, long. We can refer to them very quickly. Some of the Sharia terminology uh, of mut'a, temporary marriage, idda, you can see how they are transliterated and then translated or explained or expanded in, 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 um, uh, in English, really. It, as you can see, so Khala divorce initiated by the woman for a compensation. We will have another discussion on where, if, for example, if we have a, a marriage certificate, do we have the capacity in this document to have all this uh, information uh, in one document? I'm sure you ask this question, and I want to reflect on it possibly later in the discussion. So in a marriage certificate, do we have capacity to do all this? Although we know how to translate them, but we also need to uh, look out for other uh, complexities or other issues that we need to have solutions for. And we might discuss this later if you like. Examples like Bay al Wafai wal Amana, Al Qard al Hassan that you mentioned now, Riba, Riba al Fadl, Riba al Nasi'a, and I'm not going to read all the translations of this, it takes long, but as you can see, it's more or less the same because it's foreign terminology. We need to, to, to present it in its foreign format and then say what it is. But again, we need to have some thinking about the text we are translating it for. Is it a partnership, a partnership contract, for example? And if it's this, the case, do we, do we introduce a glossary? Of course we do, sometimes, most of the times. But in a marriage or a birth certificate or a, 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 a contract, a one-paid A4 contract, tenancy agreement if we have necessarily bail or fat or any other of the ones I gave. Do we have a space for them? Do we represent them, etc.? Uh, so many questions to ask here. But the norm is, as I presented in my book, is to borrow, to literally translate and to paraphrase. As you can see, some of the terminology we can just literally translate to usury, not necessarily lending with interest. Some of other terminology like talaq, divorce, or divorce, talaq, etc. Uh, we have a one, one, um, 
one feature of legal uh, texts that's really, it's not different because it exists in both English and Arabic. So far, I have been giving you the differences, the, the common difficulties based on some linguistic and some um, cultural specific difficult uh, differences. But here, it's not really different, but it exists in both, but we still need to think about how we translate them like doublets and triplets. The word the doublets means the two, the word triplets means the three, and they are synonymous terminology, as one of our friends mentioned earlier, or near synonymous terminology, where the pairs or three words can be Examples of this from our uh, Arabic texts, or Sharia law, زوجتي ومدخولتي. So we translate it as my wedded wife with whom I have consummated the marriage. And this is, by the way, translated translation from Basil Hatem. Basil Hatem uh, in his book, The Legal Translator at Work. And this is the authentic data I used in my book. The other one is Zawajtuka wa Ankahtuka. I have given you my daughter in marriage. So the first one, as you can see, we repeated, we used the two terminology in translation because functionally they, they mean different, they mean new things. Zawajti is different from Madhulati, as you know from Shukha is the same here in this context. So we translate it as one term or one phrase. So in the first example, as you have seen, expansion is used due to the difference of legal meaning, but in the second, we didn't use expansion, we only used one term. As for, for English, triplet, three terminology, I give, devise, bequeath all of my property there. So there are two ways of, of translating them. But as you can see, we translated every term we have because every term really means something different. So if you tell me, but we can omit something here, no, I don't think so. We need to be very careful because every term here can mean something legally binding that we are not aware of. So if in doubt, my advice to you, if in doubt, please translate everything. But you need to do your, your homework, your research, and find out whether or not these need to be uh, translated uh, in one or two or three, etc. Part of the homework. Abstract terms relate more to legislations, to international documents, to human rights documents etc. And we find them a lot and we don't really need to do anything with them. They are vague because we don't know the criteria for reasonable steps. So reasonable itself as an adjective is a bit vague. We don't know what they mean by reasonable, how reasonable it should be. And this is how vague I mean. So all what we do here is just to tr translate them as they are and leave the interpretation of them to the the concerned people really here. And we come across this uh, a lot, but I wanted to bring this to your attention that also even terminology like this cannot, can be indeterminate or vague. The same applies to this uh, slide, fundamental human rights, fairness, fair and regular trial. As you can see, literal translation is the norm here, nothing new. Okay. This is this slide. I always I always think about a lot before including it, and um, because I know it could be subject to a lot of debate and a lot of discussions. But I wanted to show you one of the international documents that I have looked at that uses um, gender bias terminology in the Arabic and in its translation. I'm not saying it's it's wrong to use the masculine. Because we know in Arabic, this is how we include in our drafting, to how we include the two genders to be inclusive, is we use the masculine to speak about both the female and male. But I, I, I brought it to your attention because it's now becoming an issue in research, in legal, and I'm sure Professor Salhi have seen this in conferences he attends or in books or researches he read. Recently, I have been to a conference in Spain and there was a heated debate about this. Also, we host in Leeds uh, a week called uh, the International Organizations Week, where we host many people from the UN working as translators in different departments, French, Arabic, um, 
uh, every language you could imagine. We also have editors, revisers, etc. And we did have a long debate on this this last year. Uh, by this, I mean I want to cut it short that my my suggestions for this it's SAT drafting could be better by using inclusive neutral language, although challenging. And when I say challenging, I mean there are lots of um, Lots of guidelines in place about how to be inclusive when you draft. When I say draft, um, there are lots of guidelines that the UN have published recently uh, that's followed by people who translate into Arabic or who draft in Arabic. And, and they follow it to some extent. I, I, I'm yet to do further research. This is one of my coming projects that I'm working on. But, for example, my la latest corpus uh, that I built, the Arabic constitutions, the 19 Arabic constitutions that have been translated into English, some of them are uh, published or drafted after the Arab Spring, and now I'm hinting into to Tunisia. Tunisia is as one good example I could, could give, that Tunisia have included in the constitution inclusive language. For example, they tended to say muatin, muatina, uh, uh, other examples like uh, talib, talib, taliba, no, muatin, muatina, what else? Muntakhib, uh, muntakhiba, ila akhiru. I was very pleased to see it in, in Tunisia, but it wasn't consistent, unfortunately. If you go to the, your constitution and look through it, it was there in some places of the document, but it wasn't consistently done. And the translation of it, which we think it's not binding, we know, but it represents the text and its identity, as we talked earlier. Again, it's not, uh, it's not consistent. And an, an Arabic charter of human rights that we have in front of us, I would have assumed that at least inclusive language could have been used in English, to, in English rather than in Arabic, if Arabic, if, if Arabic has got its constraints uh, linguistically. And it's not only linguistic constraints, I'm sure you agree, it's um, cultural constraints, religious constraints, linguistic constraints, and this is the most challenging really, because to use inclusive language in Arabic, we need to really, really, uh, to lose trouble, the language itself is lengthy, and we are talking about how lengthy it is to write in legal anyway, so we will have to use the two genders in one sentence, and all the pronominal reference, references to it, he, she, etc. And if we decided to use the plural, it's even more complicated. So I'm aware there is complexity or there is constraints, but but I don't know. I uh, we need to discuss this more. We need to research it more before we jump to conclusions. Okay, I think I'm done here in terms of the lexical terminology. I don't know, Professor Salhi, if you want me to go quickly to the complexity only. Uh, we still have almost 10 minutes, so the way okay. and we would like also to receive some questions. So can you just in one minute sure. just go over those? Uh, right. Okay. I'll, or because, yeah, because all students mentioned the complexity, so I have some tip in mind that I use with my students and which I'm keen on uh, delivering uh, to, to you today. So quickly, I will show you uh, the most common difficulties of um, uh, legal texts are syntactic, what we call syntactic difficulties. When we talk about syntax, we talk about grammar and structure here. So as you know, it's a no-brainer. English is a SVO, Arabic is a VSO. Sentences in English, and when I say VSO, subject, verb, and object, etc., you know the abbreviation. Sentences in English legal discourse are lengthy and complex and sometimes ambiguous. And I'll stop here because there is a lot more to say about the text, textual feature it, uh, itself, about how repetitive it could be, how the sentences are not clear cut because of the punctuation, etc., etc. About complexity itself, I'll give you an example, and we need to know how to come about this. And this is a tip you could, you could do with any other sort of text, really, not necessarily only legal. But if you look at this, a way of comprehending it, you need to analyze it. 
first syntactically. So it's about a, a bit of a bit of playing with this long sentence. And by the way, you could find a lot more longer sentences in English or in Arabic. Really, this is a common feature in both. So I underlined some of these for you to look at that. So this is what we have in the whole text, in the whole sentence. How many independent clauses we have? How many dependent clauses we have? How many infinitival clauses like to have access to? And how many even nominalized forms we have, like destruction, damage, loss, and the link scale change we have? By the way, all this terminology tells you a lot about the linguistics of both languages and also tells you about the features of legal texts. So what I advise you to do quickly, uh, again, this is one example from Arabic, because I always tend to give in both languages. The idea that we have conditionals like either ta'al majlis, that we have uh, alati or ladi as, as relative clauses and etc. this adds to the complexity. But in Arabic, we have another one layer of difficulty that's that the sentence that doesn't have this will define the boundaries that we don't have one many many uh, punctuation marks that we couldn't identify the stop of it and it's uh, stop of the sentence or the message really not only the sentence but in Arabic we could identify the unit easily by comprehending as I said and by laying uh, cutting it into constituent parts and phrases that we give us a well-defined message and the same applies to uh, to English so what I will tell you here to answer the question about syntax is undertake a thorough syntactic analysis, breaking the long complex sentence into meaningful units. And this aids both comprehension and also facilitates accuracy. Some of the questions I always get asked is, do we follow the target text formal structure? By formal, I mean the style, how we write it in Arabic, for example, or do we follow the order of this long sentence here as it is in Arabic, uh, in English into Arabic. So this sort of question really depends on the con we need to keep track of the content as carefully as possible. So it's advisable to follow the order and the content as much as you can, but also you need uh, you need to keep the structure of the TL, of course. Playing with the structure is dangerous. You need to be careful if you decided to change it as we do in other text types like, like media or literary. We, we do our own. We, we find our way, as one, one of the friends was saying. But here we need to be very careful not to lose uh, any of the content or to lose the accuracy of the text. By this, I mean, really, I don't have a fixed tip to give you apart from you to strike the balance. We try to follow the text as much as you can, follow the content of it as much as you can by dividing it into, as I mentioned here, it, into units like this, and then keep track of the content. So a revision also comes handy here. When you finish on your job, you need to revise. You need to find out how accurate and how, how the, the message in the source text here is presented carefully and accurately. Okay, if a lot to be say about model auxiliaries, in a nutshell, as our, our colleague yesterday was saying, there is no one-to-one -one between English and Arabic. You just need to read about the model system in English, and it's a hard thing to do, to be honest, but also read about what equivalents we have in the Arabic language. So, for example, I give you one quick example, like shall. Shall in English, legal in, 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 in general English, represents future, yes? But in legal English, it represents uh, obligation. Obligation, yeah. Yes, yes. And, and how, how we represent obligation in Arabic varies massively. So how we say, uh, sh for example, shall be elected, in this example, we we'll say, so here we have the indicative verb, as our, our colleague mentioned yesterday, we have the present verb. And that comes from the whole phrase, it shall be elected. And also, not only that, because I'm doing a longer research about this now, so 
we have a lot of other terminology or uh, verbs that we use, not only verbs, but phrases and propositions such as يجب, يتعين, يلزم. If the proposition ala and it is subordinated forms, all this I have come across not in my book, but also in the current research I'm doing on, on the ontic modality of uh, permission and obligation. So, in a nutshell here, it's not a hard job, but you need to be aware of the two systems here, linguistic systems and how, how you find the equivalence carefully. For example, shall, we cannot never translate it into self or sayaf, sayakum, sayamal, because we're not talking about the future. We're talking about the yonti means, obligation means we guarantee that something happens rather than will happen. We, we are putting it in a legal document and the use of shall is not that it will happen in the future, but it, it means that we guarantee that it happens and uh, it's, not, it's not future it's mostly present really even if it will be executed in the future uh, i hope this makes sense i'm not going to go on because the passive you could read in uh, in the book but I try to change the perception of passive we always tend to generalize and say that passive is not used a lot in arabic we don't use passive we use active in Instead, yes, I agree. Active is more common, but passive is also also exists in every language, every text type we have, including the Quran. And we know why we should use passive in media or in legal or any other text like Quran because the actor is known or the the door is known. But in, in really in Arabic, we need to know that we use passive when we don't know the agent, when we don't know the door of the action. But if we know it, we tend to use the active, and this is the bottom line, really. I think I'll stop here. Thank you so much. Excellent. Thank you very much, Dr. El Farhati, for this concise, informative, and to the point presentation. Thank you. And Thank you. you could capture the gist of it. And you, you so made much. so many issues represented in your presentation. I would like to thank, thank you very much. Let's take very quickly a couple of questions by sharing right. hands. Uh, Can I stop sharing? Yeah, yeah, please, please, please. Yes, go ahead. Okay, uh, first in, first out. Uh, Mohammed Salah Isa, Wail, uh, Rawan, Ola, and Ahmed Badran, and we'll stop. Please, very quickly. Yeah, can Mohammed I have Salah. one, one, one after one? One, like I one after one. one, yes. You'll have that. You'll have yeah, that. You. Mohammed thank Salah, go ahead, please. Uh, so, greetings. First, I'd like to thank Mr. Hamoud and our honored guest for providing us with such wonderful opportunity to dive into the ocean of legal translation. Professor Hanem Al Farahati, I hope I pronounced your name right. I've read your book five months ago, and what I'm going to say, this book paved the way for me to set my first steps on the shores of legal translation and helped me a lot gaining an overview and a glimpse of how challenging this specialized field of translation can be. And my questions and remarks are with reference to your book, and I quote, Legal translation is not the rendering of the legal text from the source language to the target language, but it is rather a translation from one legal system into another. I've witnessed the issue firsthand when I was trying to practice and translate a lease contract. For instance, the term adl ishhad, the equivalent of this word in British English is not the same in American. We are no longer talking about cultural differences, but rather a difference between one legal system to another, one official position to another. So my first question is, do you recommend us as beginner and novice translators to get ourselves exposed to different legal system or rather focus on a particular set and master it? And then I'll be moving on to page 39 from your book. And I I can you, this, yes, uh, sorry, Mohammed Salah, we don't have uh, enough time. Thank you very much. Uh, over to you. Uh, I'll take this first, yes, please. please. I'll answer these steps. Yeah. Right. Thank you so much, Mohammed, for reading the book and for getting into depth about what it involves. Yes, you are right. We, as we mentioned, it's not translation of the ST, it's translation of the TL system, really. And you have many, many examples, one of them that you have given. Thank you. My advice to you as a novice, 
service translator, trainee translator or professional legal translator, if you wanted to take this as a job, you need to be well versed in really in the language first, in linguistic system first. When I embarked on doing this project many years ago, I really did did read a lot first in legal uh, uh, legal English to start with. I attended courses and I did a lot of training with the with, with universities online and also here in Leeds, attending their courses, getting to know a lot about this system, the common law system, the civil system in France, and the, of course, uh, as well as reading a lot more and attending things about Sharia law, because this was really one basic step I, step I need to do. Uh, so it's, it's about really doing, reading a lot about the linguistic system, knowing about comparative linguistics, reading a lot about legal discourse, really. And if you wanted more, you attend the courses or read a lot about, uh, attend things, professional courses about legal systems, that the system you wanted to translate into, I don't know what it is. I give you one example from one of the conferences I attended, and I raised this question to one of the well-known professors in the US who drafts really legislations and documents. And I said to him more or less the same question you mentioned. To, you said to me, you know that in the in in the market we have many uh, novice or trainee or translators who don't have a degree in law. So what what advice you give to them? And he started laughing and looked at me very deeply, saying, "Imagine that there is one legal translator that's not a lawyer." And he started laughing. And I had the reaction from all the room saying. But the reality is not is not this. We have many people who are not who are not really lawyers who translate. So his advice was, and I agree with him, that I just gave to you about comparative legal systems awareness. Read a lot, attend the courses, familiarize yourself. But as a novice, I would familiarize myself with the system linguistically and culturally as well as then legally. I hope this answers it. It does. Yes. Thank you. Well. Hi. Well, I have just one remark regarding the translation of the text of uh, Khadim al-Haramain Sharifain. Yes, yes go the, ahead. And why the translation, uh, why the translator did not uh, remove anything. In mm -hmm. fact, if we focus on the subject matter of the text, we can understand that uh, the speaker is talking about the threat of terrorism. And he is being selective in uh, his usage of the verses from Quran, such as to deliver a message and, and to show that Islam is the religion of peace. Yeah. And, and that's why anything, uh, nothing was, uh, everything was translated, because basically this is the purpose of the text, to say yes. that terrorism has nothing to do with uh, Islam. Yes. Thank you. Yes, you. Well. You, get, you gave a very good example. Thank you for the remark. It's about, um, it's about, by the way, adding to what you have said, that is no different at all from what I have mentioned earlier. Thank you. It's about persuasion as well. So if he talks about a very debatable issue like this, using verses suitable to the Quran, from the Quran in this particular context is, a, is a, as I said, the means of representing his identity first, but because he doesn't only refer to, to this verse, but he speaks about a very long debaja or preamble at the beginning using uh, the, the religious items and at the end as well using the dumtum dhukran or whatever it was, I can't remember. So it's all about one, one, one more or less one same uh, justification that we both agree on. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now it's the turn of Rawan. Go ahead, please. Okay, thank you uh, very much for the tips you provided for beginners. Uh, I would just want you to, uh, or could you please suggest some books that presents the uh, syntactic differences between Arabic and English? Yes, very, that would be great. very good so question. Much. When I did my, my uh, degree and when I did, did write this book, I have referred to a Saeed Badawi's book and Karen writing book. I don't have the titles exactly in the top of my head. I advise you, if you have a copy of my book, go through the 35 pages long references that I have used and you will find a lot about comparative English-Arabic linguistics and comparative, uh, also uh, comparative what? Comparative law uh, studies and legal discourse in English and some of them in Arabic as well. There are not too many, 
but I advise you to go to my references if you uh, like. Excellent. Thank you, Ola. Yes, Dr. Farhati. Whoa, Begad, whoa. <laughs> I would like to ask uh, the idea of repetition in is whoa Is whoa is a good thing or a bad thing? <laughs> <laughs> in a good way, in a very enormous and, and fantastic way. I'm very proud to, to have you as an Egyptian woman who's doing all that. I'm Egyptian as well, and I hope that I could be uh, like you one day. Um, oh, thank you. My... I'm humbled. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, my question is how to deal with repetition in contracts and legal documentation. Yes, very good question. How to deal with repetition? This is the, the third chunk of my cake in the book. Uh, not, not necessarily in the book, but in my, in my dissertation, but I didn't get to discuss it thoroughly in, uh, in my book. I would really like to uh, embark on it later. But this is one of the common features. Oh dear. Oh dear. <laughs> is he hungry? <laughs> <laughs> Let me mute. Sorry. You're on the risk of being muted, Hanem. Uh, can you unmute yourself again? Let me. Sure, do. sure. Yes, yes, yes. Great. Right. So, um, uh, I was saying that one of the uh, common features of, of legal Arabic and legal English is repetition, but it's more common in Arabic than in English. And all the data I have encountered so far is that they keep the repetition as it is. We, we cannot we cannot cut it. But the documents I have looked at is the legislative documents, really. So uh, agreements and conventions, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But about contracts, also I have come across repetition, and I wouldn't advise you really to cut the repetition because it could be really used for inclusivity, to uh, to uh, emphasis for emphasis, to uh, I know, I know to keep the message. As clear as it is, although in some degree I would have cut it in some places where I have looked at the documents, but I don't think as legal translators we don't have the luxury of uh, cutting the repetition as such. I don't know if you have anything to add, Professor Salhi, to this. I really uh, not, don't know. Not, not exactly, yeah. <laughs> okay. oh, Ahmed Badran, please. I think Just last one. Yes. Please go ahead, yes. Yeah, uh, thank you, Dr. Farhati. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Salhi. Uh, this Welcome. is Ahmed Badran. Um, uh, actually, I'm working as a legal translator certified by Minister of Justice in the United Arab Emirates. But uh, I want to ask a question uh, regarding legal translation. Uh, actually, we are using legal style uh, a long time ago. Uh, but uh, lately, I have been required from some uh, legislative departments. Uh, I have a meeting with them to translate some laws which we used to use a, a legal style when we are translating using some uh, adverbs like zero and zero, as you know. Uh, but they uh, request me to translate a, a plain text. They ask me, uh, don't use legal text. Uh, did you face something like that lately? Or uh, what do you think about these uh, requirements? Thank you, Ahmed. Over to you. Hanem, you are muted again. Sorry. Let me unmute you. I, I was trying to take a snip uh, shot of my screen and I failed miserably. Oh. So I might need to do it later when we finish. <laughs> yeah, perhaps. <laughs> because I'm, I'm jumping many things at the same time. Yeah, the question about plain language has been going on in legal uh, discourse for a long time. It's very obvious in um, English. Are you translating it into English? Yeah, we yes, are translating from Arabic to English. Yes. So, if I, I've, yes, I come across a lot of this in the discussions we have in conferences, in research, and many papers I have read. There is a big, huge movement towards really using plain language. There are lots of documents and resources. I'm not sure if you have come across any of them that tells you exactly what to do or which, which words to use to replace uh, an antiquated terminology to a uh, plain terminology. So yes, it's in place. It's a debated, heated discussion. And it, it really started to be more common than before. But yes, I, I come across it and I advise you to follow it. But I'm not sure how how they ask you this if, if you don't have the resources or I, the only... No, actually, when I uh, discuss with them, they said, for example, we are not using shall in uh, mm -hmm. our legal uh, system. Mm -hmm. uh, in a state, yes. you can use must. Uh, and mm -hmm. they also, these adverbs, which is used, used in legal text, like uh, thereof, mm -hmm. therein, uh, they said, no, don't use this, uh, these mm -hmm. adverbs. Uh, yes. When I discussed with them, they said, no, we currently we are using plain language, and this is the, 
they mm -hmm. come in, in mm -hmm. our department. Yeah, I agreed completely about the, the debate about shell and how vague it is, how um, how it is used in different uh, in, in in general English and in uh, in legal English, and a lot of, of demands have been asked about changing it to will, for example, but translating it. Uh, uh, translating Yajib, for example, in Arabic into must, again, is debatable, but must is more commonly used, I agree, because shell is a bit, uh, is a bit un, 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 un indeterminate, they, call, they say. And a lot of examples I can give you within the context of the European Union, that they really introduce the use of must more than shall. Although both of them are debatable, again, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm sorry to be It is under discussion and it will on drafters itself because some of the drafters still still like to write here under and here and after in their writing and they used to shell as a bread and butter of, of their yeah. drafting. So if your client yeah. tells you what to do, you are lucky. You are lucky, you don't have to think about it. <laughs> because right. again it's about what, what clients tell us, yeah. more or less. Yes. Of Excellent. We are translating <laughs> for the client after You're all welcome. and You're being paid by the, by the client. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Farhati, for this insightful presentation <laughs> on translating <laughs> law. And I would like also to thank our dear guests and dear students for making it a high-profile discussion on translating law. And here I would like to pick up one quotation. If we there is a lesson to be drawn from this meeting, it would be you we are translating two different systems or from one uh, from one legal system to another and not we are translating legal text to another or legal language to another. So we are translating systems. And I would like to go one step further by saying or making a statement that we are not translating from a system, a legal system in one country to an, another legal system in another country or another language, but rather we have to learn about the systems, the legal systems in one single uh, country or one single legal culture, I would say, uh, because sometimes it is tricky and slippery to pick up a term in one legal uh, uh, one legal system in a particular in a sub legal system, and you apply it to another sub legal system and then you will be in a trouble. I am a conference interpreter, and I think last year I have been in a, servicing a conference on child abduction. And oh, really? the term is really subject to very heated debate between lawyers, practitioners of law, judges. And some of the translators and interpreters translated it literally uh, child abduction by one of the parents. So the legal system in English applied both. These are two concepts. Abduction as a criminal offense from the criminal law, which is a system, into a family law, another system, but within the same culture. So, and there was heated debate at that time, and the interpreter at that time had to go out of that box, the booth, and to facilitate the discussion. This is a visibility, again, of the interpreter. And I happened to be the, 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 the interpreter at that time, trying to say that abduction in English, in that particular context, it's not an offense. But the, uh, uh, the, the Arabs, the practitioners, Arab practitioners of the law and judges, for them, اختطاف, it is a criminal offense. هي جريمة بكل المقاييس وتحيل مباشرة على القانون الجزائي أو قانون الجنائي أو قانون الإجراءات الجزائية. وهي جريمة يعاقب عليه القانون بجناية. It's a felony. فبالتالي, but if a mother or a, 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 a father uh, uh, perpetrating that act of abduction, it is not a criminal offense. After all, he is or she is his mother or uh, his, his father. So uh, this, con this needs con continuous learning about the systems and the development. Perhaps in the future, Arabic will accommodate that term, that it is not a criminal offense. Who knows? And I have been tasked 
by reviewing the uh, version later. I would like to thank you again, Dr. Al Farhati, for your time, for you. your generosity, and, okay. and, and offering to present your book, which is really rich, and I recommend it to all novice and even, um, let's say, professional translators and interpreters because it is very informative and insightful, uh, insightful with examples. Uh, unfortunately, we run short of time. We wanted to uh, extend time a little bit to accommodate much discussion, but uh, this is not possible now. There are other encounters tomorrow, and tomorrow we'll be having Professor El Mansouri at 11 a.m., uh, and then another encounter with Sheikh Hamza Yusuf at uh, 7 a.m. Tunis time on interpreting Islamic religious discourse. Very I'll be good. seeing you over there. Thank you very much yeah. and bye bye. Yeah, I thank must you. Thank you. Before you go, really, Please, I, must, yes, go ahead. I must say that I'm really admiring this effort that Professor Sarhi have, have done. I don't believe at this time of, of our life, very problematic. Everybody's busy. It's COVID. It's a crisis. And he have managed to build a series of more than 25 speakers. This shows how big his network is, which is really great. But also, yeah. how, how, but, but also shows how careful and how caring about his students and about about transferring all this knowledge from different perspectives, from different fields. I really am very grateful. And I, I myself attended all day yesterday and before. Now I see how tiring it is to be by the computer for two hours every session for three times a day. It's really too much. So I must really applaud his effort. Really. Thank you. Thank you I'm very much, Dr. Al Farhati. I am really touched and humbled. <laughs> and thanks to the generosity of Thank people you. like you offering themselves available to us. My uh, pleasure. The treasure and, 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 and uh, the credit that we, we have Thank in you. life, our network. Thank yes. you very much. Thank and you so much. And, and if you have any question, I'm happy to follow up answers by email. And uh, on Twitter, I'm active. On Facebook, I'm not so active. But yes, uh, do, do send me an email if you like. Could you it's please a uh, take a Thank you for the invitation. Okay. Yeah, the email is here. Yes, I'll write it. Okay. And I wanted to take a snipping before you go, Dr. Salhi. Please go ahead. Yes, 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 with uh, everyone. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. Just a shot for my uh, records. Yeah, yeah, sure. Good memory. Thank you. It is a very good memory indeed, yeah. Yes. Well, I'll tell you when I finish. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you. Done. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Yes. See you all. Thank you. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.